lately there's been a, a good trend, you know, amongst YouTubers, friends, allies who have been denouncing civic nationalism. And you two mm -hmm. ladies have <laughs> been on board with that. Molyneux actually came out. He was realizing that demographics is everything for his goal of getting to a stateless society. We have my friend Blonde in the Belly of the Beast, lots of people. So I want to ask you two ladies, what does it mean first for people that are newcomers? They have never heard this term. What does it mean to be a civic nationalist? Lauren, I'll start with you. Well, first of all, I kind of want to, I have to neg civic nationalism a little bit because I think it's really an oxymoron. I think it should be called something rather like xenophilic nationalism. It's really not nationalism at all. And the, na uh, the oxymoron becomes more apparent when you treat it like that. Civic nationalism perpetuates that it's okay to bring foreign people into your country as long as there are a bunch of tolerant egalitarians. That's how I see it personally. Um, it doesn't take anything else into considera uh, consideration like religion, race, ethnic group, as long as you're tolerant and have egalitarian values, that seems to be okay, which we obviously see isn't working throughout Europe and the US now as the demographics change. And people see, well, people like Faith and I and Blonde and others who are making this jump that that is not the correct answer, that demographics matter. When you replace the founding stock of a nation, you replace the entire nation. And nationalists, what we want to do is preserve our homelands, preserve the nation. And, and when you, you look at the, the civic nationalism, well, why did we invent this? Why did we invent this? It was an answer to ethno-nationalism. And I don't care what anyone thinks about ethno-nationalism. You have not properly studied history uh, unless you, you can accept the fact that throughout the, the 20th century, more so than communism, more so than capitalism, more so than democracy. Ethno-nationalism was the greatest propeller of, 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 of human history when de you determining the maker or breaker of empire, of civilization. This is what rallies men and gets them moving. And even in these civic nationalistic um, little petri dishes, guess what's happened? There's a balkanization that's occurring. These, these, these ethnic lines are already forming. Otherwise, why would BLM exist? Why is there a Chinatown? Why is there a little Arabia in my own hometown? The cultural enclaves, this balkanization is already happening. And so it is a natural tribal instinct for human communities to go with their own. So the question is, are we gonna continue to, to work against nature and, 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 and try to rise above it, even though we're 40, 50, 60 years into this experiment? And, and, and those partitions are only becoming more um, uh, distinguished and identifiable? Or are we going to say, maybe it's time to disaggregate? Maybe it's time that we reconsider how we've treated our borders to date. Yep, that's right. So if you can summarize that, you know, civic nationalists, they think that all these very diverse groups of people from all around the world can come and be united by these abstract ideas or something like the Constitution, and that they'll never align uh, based, on, based on any ethnic loyalties or have any ethnic interests. And as we've seen, it's a complete failure, because if you look at Canada and America before 1965, when the demographics was mostly European, we didn't have the kind of division that we have now. So when people say people like us are trying to divide everyone know it's actually the other way around it's these globalists who have divided us <laughs> we were actually quite unified before this happened but i think it's really funny that a lot of these civic nationalists that we hear popping up that are, they claim to be more on the right side it's only white people talking like that sure you might have a few you know blacks or latinos here and there but it's, it's like it's a white ideal you know what's going to happen when they're a minority and they're <laughs> seriously you know with respect to it if i understand your argument correctly that basically um white you know, pencil necks are the ones who are pushing this idea of, of, of civic nationalism, yeah. correct? Yeah. Right. So in, in Coming Apart, a uh, great Charles Murray uh, book, he talks about this uh, establishment of almost like this, this high IQ, upper echelon of society super class with the way that basically um, marital patterns have worked out among the well-educated class in America. It's led to high IQ now marrying high IQ. You don't just have the high IQ man that is only uh, now marrying the beautiful girl next door or whatever. He's going to marry a, another lawyer within his legal practice, what have you. And so what this has done is it's created households within the super elite where um, people have very, very high IQ. And based on Jordan B. Peterson's research, high IQ people tend to have a much higher characteristic and personality trait of openness. Mm -hmm. And so you see them being very open to these ideas, etc. So it's so interesting because we are literally leading to our own demise. If you couple this yeah. with the enlightenment value of, of, uh, of individualism, etc., we literally are committing suicide 
suicide, deaths of despair. We, we by we, I mean middle-aged, uh, middle-class white men, okay, um, are, are the only um, contingent of society that are dying at a higher rate as opposed to those mortality rates going down because we've become so atomized and we've become essentially strangers in our own backyard. It's a lethal mix, and, and it's only the pencil necks at the very, very top who are saying this is a good idea. But for Joe Sixpack, white Joe Sixpack at home, this is not good. And his ER rates are going up by 300% because he's ODing on, on a bloody opioids. Yeah, exactly. Gee, and they wonder why some of the white guys are, <laughs> are kind of mad right now when they're literally on the shit list. They're last in line for schools, for loans, for jobs, for grants. They're blamed for all the problems in the world. They can't be in politics. I mean, we're talking about, you know, I have a son. I don't want him to grow up in that kind of world where he's on the shit list and then later on he's a minority. Like, how, how do you think that they're going to be treated when that happens, when tables are turned after Marxists have worked these people up to look at us and blame us for all the problems that we're evil, we're wicked. Our DNA is an abomination that was literally published in a newspaper article at a college recently. I mean, you ladies, do you, do you think about that? You and your children uh, as a minority, how do you think that's going to be if that happens? Well, absolutely. I think white men are obviously the most under attack group right now. But I especially wanted to mention, I think people really underestimate, I used to uh, a couple of years ago, the power of identity. It is not something that can be overcome. It is human nature. Uh, people like to, especially on the right, when they debate about civic nationalism or ethnic nationalism, they always like to bring up IQ and then debate race and IQ and topics like that. Honestly, I think that's sort of missing the point when you're talking about values and IQ. If a similar group has a similar set of values, similar IQ, even then, but they have a different ethnic identity, that's still a barrier that can't be overcome because values to an extent are fluid. They're at least more fluid than identity is. Identity you are born with. It is not something you can change. You know, you can be born in a horse stable. It doesn't make you a horse. Uh, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people don't really understand that. But I mean, starting with 1965 legislation, the immigration shifted from Europe to the third world. Prior to this, it was overtly European immigration with some Chinese taking the long journey over, right? Um, and we all know the third world votes for larger government, more services, and the left, this ensures their future, ensures their power to keep bringing in individuals from the third world. So they'll do anything they can to push this. I mean, how does importing more Democrat voters sound to Democrats? It sounds great, yeah. you know, keep them coming in. And non-Hispanic whites are going to become a minority by 2050, you know, within the next 30 to 40 years. And that is within less than a century of the legislation in 1965, whites are going from this vast majority of our nation, the face, the founding stock of our countries, and are now gonna become minorities in less than a century. And people think that this is all gonna be okay because we're all tolerant, right? I mean, no one, no one would blame any other group besides ethnic Europeans for being wary of this change, the fundamental change in the face of their nation. The only people who aren't allowed to worry about this are ethnic Europeans. Why is that? Because whites are privileged because they hold positions of power in their own countries? That's ridiculous. I think we should take whites and we should move to a foreign nation and start voting as voters and voting for our own interests. And then their government will start to benefit whites rather than the natives. And then when they start complaining that their new system is now benefiting us and not the natives, we can call them privileged bigots. <laughs> so identity is very powerful. And I think we need to bring it into the mainstream, get talking about identity. Like Faye said, we're not looking for violence. We just need to recognize that this change has come so quickly. And I think a lot of Americans, especially in the Midwest, who tend to actually be more right wing, they haven't even experienced it firsthand, some of them. They don't want to, <laughs> um, from my own experience. Um, I want to, with my channel especially, I'm trying to focus on, I guess you could say, ethno-nationalism, bringing identity into the mainstream. It is such a taboo thing to talk about identity, race, ethnicity. And I don't understand, well, I do understand why, but I think if we wanna get anything done, the first step is to normalize the conversation. What comes after that? There are many possibilities, but I don't like to look that far ahead, especially, you know, I'm 19, I'm just getting started. But I do recognize that the conversation is the most important step and the first step that I want to get going. I'm not sure about faith, but... Yeah. Um, okay. So for me, I'll, I'll be honest, with respect to Europe, I think it is largely lost. I think there was a permanent migration crisis there, and I wouldn't want to prescribe. I'm much more familiar with the Canadian and American case. And here, um, I, I'm interested in participating at the ballot box, which is saying this. Demographics are still going to be in our favor for basically 
to the next 20 years, which is to say there is still a white majority. And I think that any sort of movement that we have going forward has to appeal to that majority, as Donald Trump did implicitly, whether he wants to admit it or not. But he did. And if you look at the racial breakdown between the vote differences between himself and Hillary Clinton, while it looked like just a few percentages, when you looked at, you know, the multi culty vote versus the white vote, it was a landslide in either direction. So we want to definitely mobilize that force. And I don't know if honestly talking about ethno-nationalism is going to do it for the people in an explicit way, but I think we can do so in an implicit way. You have brought up too before how ethno-nationalism is seems, oh, it's a no-no, it's a no-no, but Israel is allowed to be that way. Basically, everyone around the world is allowed to be an ethnic majority in their own country, but we're only the ones charged for it when we want it. Right, ladies? Thing. I, I can't believe people don't understand that demographics is everything. It will change everything. Um, the other thing, too, uh, as we're talking about nationalism, there's this misconception that um, if we're talking about uh, an ethnic-based or ancestral-based nationalism, that there won't be some kind of minorities there. Of course there are. And we're not talking about, oh, we're going to just go round them up and deport them now. No, but we want the natives to be the majority. There will be some people that aren't of that, you know, native stock, but they need to be a smaller percentage of the population. Correct? Right? Yeah, I, I don't think it's unreasonable. And like you adequately pointed out, it's allowed for every other country. You know what I mean? So... I, I just I don't see why this is a controversial idea. For me, I put it very, very plainly, just a simple majority. Let's start there.